Tim Dick, it's great to have you here. It's great to see you. I haven't seen mm -hmm. you in a while, and I'm so delighted you're joining us on Think Tech Hawaii here in the downtown Think Tech studios. Jay, it's great to be back. It's great to see you, and it's great to see the palatial new uh, Think Tech studios. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, we, we decided we we're going to talk about Google today because you're up on that. And I guess the first order of business is talk about what came out just a couple days ago mm -hmm. um, over Google's concern about the American infrastructure and broadband and what it's going to do about it. Yeah. What do you know? Well, I, I think uh, I've been probing around with a number of folks that are really in the know on this topic. And there doesn't seem to be much out there beyond which Google has released, which is uh, they'd like to do somewhere between 3 and 10 tests, between 50,000 and 500,000 homes. Um, 500 megabit connectivity to the internet. Uh, to put that in perspective, it's somewhere between 50 and 100 times more than most people have today. And they say that they're going to price it at uh, competitive prices. So who knows whether that's going to be competitive with uh, Oceanic and Hawaiian Tel or whether it's going to be competitive with uh, getting your own OC48, which is several thousand dollars a month. So the rest is sort of a mystery. Um, they're asking for bids. They're asking for requests for quotes from communities and municipalities, and that's pretty much all we know. Well, let's back up a little. I mean, how fast is that relative to what I have now from oceanic uh, cable? Well, the basic oceanic cable today is somewhere between 5 and 7 megabits down, down, downstream. To put that in perspective, streaming a full high-definition television picture is about 5 to 6 megabits. So it's pretty fast. I mean, you can watch a full-on high-def TV with stereo and all that other good stuff at the rates that we're getting today. Um, Hawaiian Tel is about the same, and you can upgrade to somewhere around two to three times that speed, 10 to 15 megabits if you're a real bandwidth <coughs> hog. Um, I've sort of surveyed a number of uh, my friends in the high-tech industries here, and interestingly, none of them have paid the extra 10 to $20 a month to upgrade between 5 to 7 megabits and 15 megabits. So that's kind of interesting to me, that nobody's willing to pay a couple hundred bucks a year to double the rate that they're getting today. I will give you an answer. Okay, it's, I'm in. Aside from the money, yeah. it's the notion that you can do fine with the 7. Yep. Uh, if there was software out there, mm -hmm. which I think Google contemplates, if mm -hmm. there were functionality out there, that wouldn't work on seven, and it would work really swell on 15 or much more, yep. uh, then people are going to pay for it because they want the functionality. What do you think? I think I agree with you. Um, the best benchmarks for these um, very high speed uh, are Korea, number one, Japan, number two, three, and the Scandinavian countries. Uh, in Finland and Korea in particular, uh, you can get 100 megabit um, internet. So what are people doing with it? If you can already watch you know, broadband content today at five megabits, um, the primary application that people seem to be using is high-speed three-dimensional video gaming. It's the video gamers that are doing this, the peer-to-peer -peer virtual world kind of things. And those applications seem to be using around 30 to 40 to 50 megabits. And that seems to be the fastest class of applications that's out there. Uh, once you get away from things like transferring uh, very large files for, say, medical imaging. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the local clinic could actually receive over the Internet uh, your full MRI files? And those are, you know, gigabit size files. And it usually today, they hand you a DVD. That's your medical record today. It's still sneakerware. It's still FedExing media today. So there are some um, consumer-related, consumer-useful kinds of applications, but we haven't been able to find anything that people are, are using today that's beyond 50, 70 megabits. I remember reading somewhere that the, the, the new Google, what Google wants to do will mm -hmm. let you download a full-length, high-definition movie in only a few minutes, mm -hmm. um, like uh, less than five minutes. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then that's going to, I think, that's going to change movies. That could well change movies. You're right. If you're looking at the, the, the download scenario where, again, you're downloading large files occasionally, uh, this makes this much more practical. So if you're downloading, say, uh, a movie from iTunes or from Amazon, the ability to do that in high def in a, uh, in a few minutes is a nice thing to have. Versus the streaming, so here you actually get into the paradigms. Are we moving more to a cloud-based infrastructure where everything is being streamed to you? Or are we moving to a download, store it locally, and play it later? And not I don't clear, know. Not, not clear. clear, yeah. yeah. And, may, and maybe that's one of the answers that Google is looking for is 
What do people do if you throw a bunch of bandwidth at them? And, and by the way, if you think about the kind of bandwidth they're delivering, let's say you get five megabits right to your house. Well, the router you have today won't deal with 500 megabits. So they're going to have to give you a new router, even once it gets to your house. You're going to have to plug your PC right into that router. And many PCs don't have the ability to even process 500 megabits. But forget things like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi in your house absolutely tops out at about 100 megabits. Best case, only one device on the, uh, on the Wi-Fi circuit. So there's quite a bit to actually getting this 500 megabits of theoretical capacity into somebody's PC and truly making it useful. Well, that's another question: Is is Google going to do that? Can no, they do it? Just just talking, you know, uh, in in terms of uh, prediction, mm -hmm. speculation, yep. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you do that, and your existing uh, computer isn't going to handle the speed, yep. you're going to go out and buy a new one. You're going to buy a new router, new computer. Somebody's going to mm -hmm. invent high high speed wireless to catch all that speed. And now we're going to have a boom in, in the whole computer business, aren't we? Because everybody mm -hmm. will want the kind of functionality, which we'll talk about in a minute, will want that functionality. They'll go out and, and, and it'll be a new generation. It'll, be, um, it'll take us out of the recession, Tim. I'm hoping it will, Jay. <laughs> I'm hoping you're right. You know, fingers crossed. Fingers would touch, touch plastic here. Um, it would be interesting to look at, again, you know, what are the object lessons for the places like Korea that has the highest speed penetration. The penetration rate of the 100 megabit option is still only about 10 percent. They've got about 83 percent penetration of, of high speed internet, which is higher than we are today um, in terms of the people that are actually using it versus the homes past. Uh, to give you a comparison, 94 percent of homes past in the United States today have three to ten megabits of internet access available to them. But our actual penetration rate, the actual people who have adopted it, is only about 67 percent. There's still quite a few people who today who don't have high speed internet, not because it's available, just because they choose not to. Uh, in Korea, 83 percent of the homes passed actually have high speed internet, although 100 percent of the homes passed have it available, and only 10 percent of those people choose the very high speed option. And it tends to be the gamers. So far, this has been a game driven uh, um, um, option. And games have been, if you think about it, where a lot of the leading edge technology goes. So if there we're at three dimensional virtual worlds today as displayed on a, on a screen, is the next step you know, a holograph, kind of the holodeck or something like that. Uh, which if you think about it, could make a very compelling game but it also could enable things like robotic surgery, right? Because now you have this sort of virtual world that you're starting to create as long as all of the parts can keep up with each other. Yeah, games are only the, you know, the, the play for mm -hmm. something real serious down the pike. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, you know, I think um, the platform, this is probably a poetic way to say this, mm -hmm. the platform will engender the software. That, you know, when you have a fabulous platform, you'll mm -hmm. find ways to use it. So take games, do uh, robotic surgery, uh, have interaction. You talk about the mm -hmm. cloud versus download. You know, this will be interaction all over the world. Everything will be software as a service, don't you think? Because you don't need to worry about local networks. Everything will be on the internet. Uh, I think that's right. I mean, that's certainly one of Google's emphasis today, which is you get your Gmail on the web, you get your Google apps, your spreadsheet, your word processing. Everything is kept in the cloud. And what you're seeing is the other trend, which is not the faster PCs, but it's to smaller, lighter, lightweight PCs, these netbooks, where essentially you've got a keyboard and a display layer, your browser, and everything comes through to you through a, a browser. So on the one hand, we've got the sort of these gamers that are going to these very, very high speed um, PCs, bleeding edge PCs, the overclockers as they call them. And on the other end, the more consumer trend is towards these very lightweight netbooks which have probably the tenth of the power of the, the MacBook that I have here. So we're seeing a diversion. And that's another experiment that Google, I guess, can watch evolve. But whether it's a work type computer, you know, or um, an entertainment computer, mm -hmm. uh, whatever trail they take, mm -hmm. each one of them will have tremendous benefit. I just, I'm thinking of the news. We're doing a program uh, in March about mm -hmm. news morphosis. I hope you come. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I got the invitation. <laughs> right. yep. I'll be here. And uh, this, you know, this this whole idea of transferring news, transforming news from a conventional media to the mm -hmm. internet is going to be affected by the high speed aspect of this mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. 
so for example if you look at the Wall Street Journal now you'll see that you can get alternate news on video yeah. on the New York Times too whatever the business model mm -hmm. you can watch video all day long video is the new language don't you think I agree. Video is the new language. It is more uh, communicative and more compelling, in some ways too compelling. It's addictive. Uh, but if you look at the amount of uh, information uh, that young to old students retain coming out of video, it's greater than that typically in reading for certain kinds, for macro issues, details less so. So uh, these, these are new paradigms. And a collateral effect to that is the actual production of the programming itself, the news programming or let's take Lost here, shot right in, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii for the past six years, Hawaii Five O is coming back. There's a big film industry here in Hawaii. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of having to go down to the film studios to do the editing suite, you could actually do this from home. You could get a multi-gigabit download of the day's shots and you can sit there on your PC and actually do the editing. T today a PC with a decent sized screen is perfectly capable of running the high def editing suites that are used to actually produce TV grade and movie grade uh, motion pictures. The reason people go to the film studios today is that's where all the data is and there aren't enough pipes to get that out to the community. So maybe we're enabling a new mechanism of more distributed working in the film and media industry, not only within here in Hawaii, but moving things back and forth to Hollywood or Bollywood or, or wherever it is. So. I think it goes further still, aside from video. Beyond video. Beyond video. Beyond video. <laughs> BV, <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> On it, video. <laughs> it's collaborative work, uh, okay? So, uh, you know, a few years ago, people started to collaborate, especially on academic projects. Yeah. And you'd have a few in a conference call, and then they'd work on the same document. Mm -hmm. Then Google made some programming, you know, so you could work on the same document on the same object. But, but if you had really high speed, mm -hmm. you could have more people collaborate from more places in the world. You could strap the whole human race together all at the same time. This has implications. I think this does have some implications, Jay. It's, it, it, it uh, staggers, the, uh, staggers the imagination, Jay. Um, well, we have the world that's tied together today, and what's interesting is we're seeing a, uh, a tying together the world, but we're also seeing a self-selecting self kind of fragmentation as well. People dividing themselves into communities of ideas that are in common rather than integration of a whole. So it's, it's going to be very interesting to see those kinds of trends, do they continue, do they change as, as bandwidth and processing goes up? Um, I want to come back to another uh, example of what could be done with very high-speed internet. I want to use a Hawaii-specific example, again, a little bit like film. Um, the 30-minute telescope looks like it's really going to happen in Big Island, which is terrific. Um, Big Island, a number of years ago, was the recipient of a Department of Agriculture grant for rural development. And there was an enormous amount of fiber to the home laid in Big Island, which never was enabled. Mm. So if you think about the amount of money that Google might have to spend in a community to truly lay, lay um, you know, terabit quality uh, fiber to each home, um, it's unclear to me right now whether Google knows what it's paying off. You know, hopefully it won't be like their plan to cover San Francisco with Wi-Fi, which was this big hoo-ha, big public thing, and it came to naught. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they're looking for a wonderful stranded asset today to leverage, that's a very interesting combination because if you think about what's happening coming out of that telescope every night is multi-terabits of data that need to be processed and interpreted. So instead of either putting your facilities right up on the mountain, wouldn't it be terrific to be able to have a community, people working in their homes, the scientists, the lab folks in and around the area with the ability to move back and forth these you know, colossal amounts of data needle, needed to uh, enable that kind of scientific research. So here you've got supply on the one hand, we've got all this dark fiber that needs repurposing, a wonderful community, certainly fits in that 50,000, 100,000 kind of um, group that, that Google is looking at and a world-beating set of applications that could be enabled. So if I think about, is Google laying this, and again, we don't know about this, is Google laying the groundwork for a 10-year experiment where they're willing to put it out there and simply see what happens and evolves? Because these communities are going to have 500 gigabit, uh, megabit connectivity. Uh, but to your point about the rest of the world, it's not. So you've got this, these small, isolated 
pods of very high speed connectivity, um, but then the rest of the world isn't connected at that speed. So what are the applications that those physical, physically tied together communities could come up with to utilize? And so I'm thinking of the film industry here, mainly on Oahu, and the, uh, the scientific community on, on Big Island that could be leveraged by some of these kinds of, uh, of, uh, of opportunities. And I'm thinking of all the other communities. Every other community. What I mean is, you know, right now, mm -hmm. a lot of offices do virtual. Yep. And you work at home. And, and in the last only year or two, mm -hmm. there's been, a, even in Honolulu, mm -hmm. there's been a remarkable increase in that. Yep. And some people just never go to the office at all. They work at home all the time. And I know you have to go to the office once in a yep. while, but the office becomes less important, yep. smaller, yep. cheaper to operate, and they stay at home and they're next to the icebox having a good time all day. Yeah. But, but <clears throat> the thing is that it's not quite perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not really fast enough. Uh, there are applications that don't really w work that well on virtual mm -hmm. networks right now. If you had really high speed, mm -hmm. it would be like you were there for everything, yep. and if, if not faster. And you could actually increase the functionality, and mm -hmm. that would work too. Mm -hmm. So I, I suggest to you, Tim, that it wouldn't only be the scientific guys in the 30-meter telescope. Mm -hmm. It would be everybody could work anywhere no impediment whatsoever. Change the world. It would change the world, Jay, you're right. Um, and certainly make my life easier because it would probably keep my butt off a plane more than it is, <laughs> which is great. And it's already changing. There's already lots more that we can do without flying physically, moving our, our human mass back and forth. Um, and that's a, that's a question as well because Google has an entire you know, battery of, of tools and applications that they have today, will they produce optimized versions of those applications for the people in these test communities? In other words, today we look at um, Skype video conferencing, for example, and it's kind of fuzzy and it's a little bit unreliable and so on and so forth, but it's nice and lots of people use it. Uh, will they take uh, their video conferencing, G-Chat or whatever their, their application is, and turbocharge it for those folks with multi-megabit uh, connections? So not only those communities, but if your friend in, uh, in China or Korea uh, also has very high speed connectivity, the ability to actually have much, much higher quality interactions that are, um, you know, a Cisco likes to use the word telepresence. And I don't know if you've seen these telepresence suites with the virtual walls, and it's a, you know, half of a conference room with the mirror. Um, those kinds of applications are, are quite compelling if you've, uh, if you've experienced them. This takes you to the whole notion of disruption. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Skype is nice, but if somebody comes up, mm -hmm. somebody recognizes the power of this mm -hmm. fast broadband yep. and, and, and jumps over Skype with something much better, much faster, much more immediate, you know, in your face, mm -hmm. they're going to they're gonna eclipse Skype in no time. That could be Google. Mm -hmm. But it suggests to me that this is going to be disruptive for a mm -hmm. whole new generation of software. Mm -hmm. And one hardly knows who will be on the top two or three or five years from now. Mm -hmm. So um, who are you going to invest in, Tim? You're a venture capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you where I'm investing. <laughs> I'm investing in security companies. Ah. Um, I'm on the board of two today. We actually have three in our portfolio. Um, it, didn't, it didn't happen actually in a planned way. They're all individually attractive uh, uh, investments to our fund, Startup Capital. Uh, but it is certainly a trend that we're seeing, and again, speaking of Google, of course, just back in the December-January time frame, uh, we've seen the, uh, the Chinese attack on Google, uh, the theft of email addresses, data, and so on and so forth, uh, on a grand scale, grander than we've seen before, but still cat and mouse games in terms of what all you know, full-out attacks are. Uh, so if you're thinking about these you know, giant, very, very high-speed um, types of internets, uh, most attacks today are perpetrated through what's known as botnets. These are inf infected PCs that, uh, with a virus that have been controlled by outside um, the essentially the infected agent's um, controls. Some of these networks of zombie PCs are over half a million devices. Well, how effective can an, an attack by these large botnets be? if the connection to the internet, their upstream bandwidth is say 512K. Well, not that big, right? Now, what happens if you connect a set of infected PCs at half a gigabit? You've got enormous amounts of firepower there in terms of the ability to do real damage to the internet and in terms of uh, 
uh, denial of service attacks and so forth. So hand in hand with these bandwidth enhancements, we have to have a greater degree of security because unleashing um, you know, botnets of that type of magnitude is a threat that uh, no country could withstand right now. We've already seen very small attacks on countries like Estonia and even the White House website, right? We don't even know. Was it Korea that took out the White House website and the Department of Defense or was it China? We don't know. So imagine um, you know, a botnet attack that was unleashed at uh, you know, 100 times the capacity of what's going on today. Um, that's a huge threat that goes along with this huge opportunity. Now, I don't think that's the experiment that Google wants to run. No. But if it doesn't do something proactively, it'll be exper an experiment that it is running. Because right? who knows what's on you know, my PC or your PC, with all due respect. You, know, you can't take any significant step, any disruptive step like this, without considering yeah. security. You're absolutely yeah. right. And you really want, you know, I believe that the, uh, that the war has already started, cyber war. It's already going on. Yeah. And take out my server in no time. Mm -hmm. It's different than it was, and, and the motivations are different, the rewards are different, and the scope of the, you know, the, scope of the damage mm -hmm. is yeah. different. So if you increase the speed, oh, 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 the stakes will be higher yet. I think it's right. And uh, I, I think that we're bound to go there. We're bound to go there. We're going there now, and we're relying on the computer all the more. The higher the speed gets, the more we rely, the more the government relies, the more industry, every business, every person relies. So if it comes down one day, our society in general is in trouble. It's not a luxury. <laughs> I agree with that, Jay. People are using the term cyber Pearl Harbor. When will the cyber Pearl Harbor happen? Um, we don't know. We don't know when it will happen, if it will happen. But the mere mention of it indicates that there is a magnitude of threat that's out there today that mean it could happen. And we have at once the most advanced computational uh, society uh, on Earth, but also at once the most computer dependent um, society on Earth. The cash we get from our ATM, the ability to go to the supermarket and buy products, the ability of the supermarket to get product onto its shelf, um, you know, railroads, uh, utilities, electric functions, the telephone, almost all telephony now at some point goes over an IP network, an internet protocol network. All of that goes at risk if there is an all-out uh, cyber war. And there are things that, uh, that we can and should be doing to upgrade our network as a nation, some of which China is already doing in, in a strange ways where we're pushing them to do this, um, but we're not doing today. And that's an area to me that is of great interest. Uh, one of our challenges in the net, uh, with the net today, is we're running out of addresses. The protocol that the internet runs on today is internet protocol version four. Uh, 25 years ago it was considered that that would be more than adequate, but today we have effectively run out of addresses. So we have a whole bunch of schemes today that essentially allow us to reuse addresses. Imagine if your house, every time you came home, had a different street address to it. That's what it's like. Every time your computer, you, that probably the one you're using or even watching this on, uh, signs onto the internet, it's assigned a temporary address through schemes called DHCP and NAT network addressing tr uh, translation. Well, that's very convenient, but it's a Band-Aid. And guess what it allows to do? It allows bad guys to hide. It allows the botnets to be completely anonymous. So this gets back to the attack on the White House and the Department of Defense. They don't know whether it came from Korea and China because they don't know what the address is. So imagine if, if you know, there's no way uh, that this has ever happened uh, in history before. A physical address has always been a physical address. And if I commit a crime from my address, well, they know where they're going to come and get me. You can't do that with the Internet. So you can't say, hey, Jay's the bad guy. We're going to turn off his computer. You can't find Jay. They don't know who Jay is. And Jay could be anywhere. Jay could be in China. So this is a, a big risk. Now, the good news is uh, IP version 6 has been out there for some time. Uh, it's, it's got uh, 100,000 times more addresses than there are people on the planet. So it's never going to run out. Um, interestingly, China is already the leading deployer of IP version 6. You might say, why? Do they think an attack might happen? Partly yes, but in a strange way, we're actually pushing them to adopt this. The reason is the remaining IP version 4 addresses are almost all held by the United States and Europe. China 
law of unintended consequences, is being pushed to adopt IP version 6. So does that make them more or less secure than us? I think it makes them more secure and us more at risk. So something that we could do as a nation, and I hope Google follows up on this because they have been on the vanguard of IP version 6, is to make sure that these 500 uh, megabit networks are all 100% end-to-end IP version 6 compliant. So computers have real addresses and they can't create mayhem on a grand scale. Now we should do that as a nation. More on China. More on China. You know, there was mm -hmm. a very interesting story in the paper about mm, eight months, ten months ago, mm -hmm. regarding some graduate students at the University of Toronto um, who were um, doing work to figure out who was hacking who. And they identified a location west of Beijing in China as a location that was hacking governments and military establishments all over the world. And uh, they identified who'd been hacked, uh, although they couldn't be sure who was actually doing the hacking in China. And then on uh, 60 Minutes, just a couple months ago, there was an extraordinary uh, revelationary story, to, to my mind, where they revealed that uh, some of the chips that were being made in China had piggyback mechanisms on them that weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> And you wondered who was watching who about what. So what's happening, at least uh, from the U.S. looking west, there's a certain paranoia going on about China looking into our systems, hacking our systems, and maybe worse. Uh, on the other hand, it's also pretty clear that we do the same. <laughs> so what's going on? Is this, is this a reflection of a war as I see it? Um, or is, it, is this part of the process of going forward? That's a very good question, Jay, and I think you're right. There is a very, very high level of <clears throat> cat and mouse game that's going on between the United States and China in particular. China, Taiwan, make most of the chips in the world, including most of the chips that have United States names on them, like Intel. So if they're not doing the actual fabrication, they have a level of control over the ability to do those, those fabrications. China has its own set of, par of uh, paranoias. For example, it's concerned that most of its computers use Microsoft Windows. Worse yet, most of the copies of those Windows are pirated copies that aren't updated properly and are particularly at risk for viruses and infections. So on the one hand, China makes our chips, our chips, the world's chips, and the United States makes their operating system. So it's a little bit like the balance of trade and the codependency <laughs> upon the, the two of ours. Now, if you think about that in terms of what it means and if this is sort of a cyber war that's going on, it's a lot more difficult to build a chip fabrication facility someplace outside of China than it is for China to develop its own flavor of operating system. Indeed, they could very easily start with the kernel of the uh, open source operating system, Linux, chinese it, if you will, and simply mandate that that be the standard operating system going forward. And we all know computers don't last much longer than five years. So within the five, five years, they essentially have a fully Chinese uh, computer system. So codependency uh, today is probably pretty handy. Um, with the countries starting to distance themselves, I think we'll start to see a, a separation of the technology platforms as well. Um, so how that will play out, we don't know. Stay tuned. Do we have adequate international organizations that look into this? Um, like the organization that looks into the assignment of addresses and, right. and domain names. Uh, are there other organizations that look into, you know, let's play fair on a global basis. Let's protect the openness of the web, all that. Let's avoid unfair competition mm -hmm. and, and worse, uh, cyber war. Uh, do we have an adequate global structure on that? That's a very good question. Uh, as you mentioned, the Internet Commission for Assignment of Names and Numbers, otherwise known as the people who give you your domain name and assign the domain names and so forth, uh, has hitherto been controlled, if you will, by the United States. And, and other countries mistrust that. Uh, so far, it seems that the governance has been good and fair uh, of that, by and large. Um, but that's going to change. It's going to become more of a multilateral wor world. I can, uh, if you will, uh, is pushing IP version 6. They're also pushing secure domain name services. Um, domain name services, DNS if you will, is like the phone book that your computer uses every time you want to go to thinktech.com. 
right? Are you really going to Jay's site, or are you going to go? You're going to somebody's site in China that's pretending to be uh, Jay Fidel. Um, today, the DNS system is essentially completely insecure. It runs over the same pipes that we use to actually send each other email and so forth. There is a set of protocols, unsurprisingly called secure DNS or DNSSEC, as it's known. Um, that endeavor to secure the domain la name layer so that it is not vulnerable to attack. And this is the, this is the type of attack that was used to hijack whitehouse.gov to prevent people to go, from going to the real White House website, which is pretty embarrassing. It's happened twice, um, once maybe from China, once in 2001 from some kids hacking it. So that's how easy it is to essentially rearrange everything uh, on the Internet today. And that's, that's pretty confounding if you think about the inability that you might have if you woke up one day to send an email, receive an email, um, go to any website. That's trivial to hack that system today. Again, something that ICON is pushing, uh, I think our country should be pushing that as well. We've got to secure our internet because we are the most internet dependent society on earth. Off of the good old days you know, when it was completely open, governments weren't involved where you could you know, do whatever you wanted. I think those days are really over as a matter of necessity. I, I agree with you. The idea of the Internet was <clears throat> something that was truly open. And uh, for a while, I think it was a wonderful world. But uh, we can't imagine our telephone system ever having that sort of regulation, or uh, lack of regulation, if you will, um, or the water system. Imagine if you could simply connect whatever source of water you wanted right into the water pipes, or you could build your own on-ramp onto the freeway and drive a 12-foot wide car at 170 miles an hour. These are all networks, too. We can't imagine those networks existing without regulation, but that's what the Internet today is. And the interesting thing about the Internet is it's become the network that runs all the other networks. So I agree with you, Jay. It's uh, sad as it is, it, it's, it's going to happen. I had, Probably a call, rather uh, later. I had a call today with uh, Hawaiian uh, mm -hmm. Telecom, mm -hmm. and they're rolling out all kinds of new products. Mm -hmm. You know, they're coming out of bankruptcy and rolling out all kinds of new products. And all these products are dependent on, on Internet telephony. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. it's all about broadband. It's, all, it's different than mm -hmm. copper wire conventional mm -hmm. telephones. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is probably happening around the world. It goes way beyond Skype. It's like everybody is going to be making telephone calls on the internet. Yep. <laughs> and, and so again, it goes back to that point is if you mess up the internet, then you stop even telephone calls. That's right. There is no alternative mm -hmm. system. There is no escape. Right. You are all, everybody is locked into whatever it provides or doesn't. And um, I, can, I can just imagine some pretty heavy regulation. Physically, though, how, how do you prevent, is there a way to prevent hackers and bad guys to mess up the Internet? Could you lock the system somehow so they can't get in? Or is it this is always going to be a cat and mouse game for as long as the world exists? <laughs> Um, well, hmm, two-part answer, and then I'd like to hear your, your responses too, <laughs> is uh, you know, how secure do you want the Internet to be? So we've been talking largely today about the software that runs the Internet. But what is the Internet? It's a bunch of wires and fibers, right? Physical stuff. Um, two, three years ago, there were coincidentally, not one, but two cable cuts, physical cuts of the cables that uh, occurred several miles apart off Egypt where a whole bunch of undersea fiber cables come together in a junction, right? And these lead from uh, Japan, India, uh, the Middle East, through Europe, uh, up across, and then transatlantic. And these cables, somehow or other, were mysteriously cut. So when the first cable was cut, it said, oh, it was a tanker, and the anchor dragged. Well, it turns out that the anchorage um, was several miles from where they stayed. And then a few days later, another cable was mysteriously cut nearby. Um, so was that a cat and a mouse? Was that somebody's underwater sub and they're just testing out their ability to assume, well, let's, let's see what happens when we cut off that. And for a period of several months, the Internet's traffic couldn't go through that, that bottleneck, through the Red Sea. It all had to route through North America, across the Pacific, and around and it caused a global brownout. Two physical cable cuts. How hard is that to do? You, you got a, a guy, some, a bunch of scuba divers and, uh, and some uh, you know, fancy bolt cutters, and you're done. And it's not so, a coincidence. It's not. <laughs> well, you figure it out. <laughs> it never happened before, and then it happened twice in three days. Hmm, what a coincidence. Could be a coincidence. Um, uh, 
Uh, but it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, are people sort of probing what happens there? How redundant, how resilient is the Internet today? Um, so there's, there's the physical layer, the actual pipes themselves, which are more concentrated than they've ever been before, partly because of the attractiveness, these huge bandwidths. If you can stuff trillions of bytes a second through one fiber, now you're dependent upon one fiber. That wasn't bef possible before. So you had wires down every railroad track in the country, every gas pipe, every you know, steam pipe and so forth had wires running down for it. So the ability to create physical mayhem in the past was very low. You could only snip little bits here and there. You could take out a few towns and so forth. Maybe you could take out one city. Now you can take out half the planet with a few frogmen. So that's at the physical level. Uh, at the software level, uh, the, the best weapons we have in terms of, of mitigating many attacks are IP version 6 and, and secure DNS. Um, now, when you're talking about potentially nations going to war, is that going to stop them? No. Is it going to dramatically impact private botnets and spam engines and so on and so forth? Absolutely. It's going to make the Internet much uh, harder to create uh, mayhem than before. It's something that we must do. And the FCC actually has the ability to, to regulate that. It hitherto hasn't because it's been a long-standing United States policy, essentially, to make the Internet a truly open place. But I think, as you, as you point out, Jay, 20 years from now, for sure it's not. So when is it going to start to be regulated? It's just a matter of time. Well, with regulation. Well, before or after Pearl Harbor, I guess, is the question, <laughs> right, right? right? I mean, that's the question. Pearl Harbor is the, one, is the thing that disrupts it, and then yep. bang. But, you know, whatever gets regulated, uh, assuming mm -hmm. the world continues and, and humanity continues in the same way, whatever mm -hmm. gets regulated ultimately gets overregulated, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if I can say that. And, and you have government now. Yeah. Government wants to know more about people. It wants to prevent terrorism. Mm -hmm. It wants to prevent mm -hmm. bad acts. Yep. So it takes, it takes freedoms. It takes liberties, rather. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes freedoms and it takes liberties at the same time, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah, both sides <laughs> of the same coin, right? <laughs> So, so uh, it's, you know, it's already happened. There was a book a few years ago called The Smart Mob by a guy mm -hmm. named Rein, Reinhold, Reinhold, mm -hmm. Reinhardt, Reinhardt. And um, he wrote about a, a small uh, town uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe mm -hmm. where the square was empty. At 2 o'clock, all of a sudden, there were 200,000 people in the square mm -hmm. all eating ice cream cones, and they were all vanilla. At, um, two th and taking photographs of each other. Hmm. At, at 10 minutes after 2 o'clock, they disappeared. And the police were standing there, scratching their heads, wondering what happened. You only knew one thing. These people could not have done that by, by, at random. Mm -hmm. There had to be some kind of communication <laughs> device. Mm -hmm. The Internet changes politics. Technology changes politics. Uh, just one more piece, and I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll ask my mm -hmm. question. In today's paper, there was a story about Iran and the protests by the anti-government, uh, the anti aminabatajad uh, mm -hmm. forces in yep. Iran, um, you know, and, and the government was responding to them, and the government was using paintballs, paintballs, and, and the soldiers on the roof would shoot particularly obnoxious protesters mm. with paintballs, and then the mm. police would come, and they would pick up the guys who had paint on their clothing. Mm. Okay, now that's high tech, very creative stuff, mm -hmm. But it shows you how technology can change the way government works and the way government interfaces with people, mm -hmm. and especially protest. Yeah. So the internet, exactly the same thing. You know, those black boxes uh, in mm -hmm. the provider's office mm -hmm. and all that stuff happened during the, the Bush administration. I think we're going to see a whole different world in that going forward, don't you? I do. James Bamford, speaking of books, has written a variety of uh, books on this subject going back to the days of uh, Project Echelon. And I think it's widely known that uh, uh, the governments today um, have the ability to read almost every message that we create, whether it's voice, this tape, uh, email, and so forth. So uh, yes, that's already being used as a tracking mechanism. And uh, there are cat and mouse games going on between the, the governments trying to tap their own taps. And then there's Google itself. One of the things that, uh, that you sign up to when you get a Gmail account is Google says, we're going to read everything you do. And we're going to use that to target advertising at you. So government, Google, we're being watched. Everything we do today uh, essentially is being watched by uh, someone. Google is not a common carrier. And that's one of the interesting things about uh, Google's experiment. Will it truly be a common carrier? Or does it want to leverage the information in that pipe to target more advertising to you and so on and so forth? So 
Um, the information we're creating, using, exchanging today uh, is not as private as it used to be um, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, some of which are benign and some of which are less benign. Google, you know, at first it seemed like such a creative bunch of guys, mm -hmm. you know, kids even, who um, mm -hmm. just working on almost, uh, uh, you know, silly things. And then, and then they had something. And they're so far, far thinking, you know, they're so, they, they see the world and they see the future of the world and they, and they create the future. And, you know, this thing about um, changing the infrastructure and making the speed faster is only one of a number of really creative and uh, I, I like to use the word courageous. They've mm -hmm. been courageous too in China. So what do you think is their, their real style? What are we dealing with here? Google is more than the sum of its parts. <laughs> I agree with you, Jay, and I think we're just starting to see what uh, uh, Google's ambitious ambitions are. Uh, they're certainly great at um, creating all kinds of interesting experiments, whether it's the Google Apps, where the first um, free instance of uh, really robust word processing, spreadsheeting, presentation applications, instead of using an application on your PC like Microsoft Office, which many of us do. That's a brave and bold experiment. It's never been done before. Your data is stored up in the quote-unquote cloud, the Google Sphere. Um, all sorts of other things, great patent search, uh, Gmail, uh, maps, wonderful maps, uh, the aerial photo photographs, and then the street view driving up and down the street. Um, what's interesting is Google is an information company. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that's interesting about Google, which the EU has a lot of trouble with, is Google never disposes of any of information. So every, th every piece of mail, everything, every search that's ever been done, is still stored in their servers somewhere. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. So you're, you know, Google's what you're, you're using Google, and Google is watching you, and it's keeping that record as well. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but then, if you think about Google in its broad sense as uh, an information provider, when you use Google Search, we think that Google is searching everything. That's our assumption, right? If it's not on Google, kind of doesn't exist. Right? It's not on Google. Couldn't find it on Google. It must not be there, or it's secret. So. A few months ago, Google looked at acquiring a little company called Yelp, and they do restaurant reviews and stuff like that, so you can find out, or you know, they, you know maybe I can look you up there. You know, what's the, the Yelp rating for Jay Fidel? So if you search on Google and you search on a local restaurant, chances are pretty good that you're going to see a Yelp result on that first page. So I was thinking, Google decided not to acquire Yelp, or maybe Yelp did, aside, decided not to be acquired. What if Google very quietly tweaked its search algorithms, and now the Yelp results didn't show up on that first page. It's like Yelp doesn't exist. So Google has essentially created responsibility for itself. It's a responsibility of a for-profit corporation whose fiduciary duty to its shareholders is to earn more next quarter than it did last quarter, and to continue to do that, that is now essentially the source of all information. Sure, we could go to Microsoft Bing, which is a great service, or, you, or, you, or uh, Yahoo and so forth, but 85% of people don't. So Google is now a common carrier-like responsibility for information. You were talking earlier about regulation. How do you regulate that? Do you? What if, it dis what if something disappears for from Google? It doesn't exist anymore. So. It's very you know, it's a scary. question. I don't know the answer to this it's, one, Jay. When you start thinking, when you start exploring the corners of this question, it's very scary. Yeah. They're not regulated, and they happen to be a bunch of good-natured guys right now, real smart guys. Mm -hmm. When Michael Jones, who was the, the founder of mm -hmm. uh, Google Earth, was mm -hmm. out here speaking last spring, I, I asked him, uh, so, you know, you guys have so much information. Mm -hmm. um, should we be concerned? that your information mm -hmm. will fall against your will into mm -hmm. the hands of government mm -hmm. and be used against us at some point. Mm -hmm. And his answer was, no. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was mm -hmm. his answer. <laughs> well, you know their motto. What? We are not evil. Okay. That is Google's motto. Yeah. We are not evil. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting. How would, a, how would a startup choose a motto that we are not evil? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's as a if the question, odd, isn't it? As if you, we might think that otherwise, you know. Yes, that's right. No, don't worry. We're not ego. Don't We're worry. not evil. It says so on the cover. <laughs> well, it's very scary because yeah. you know here I uh, my server was attacked not yeah. too long ago, Ooh. 
and uh, lots of infection. Mm -hmm. It was so profound that I could not actually recover the server. Oof. But but how how did I become aware of this? Well, a a, a window came down on the on, on any website mm -hmm. that that anybody tried to use from mm -hmm. the server says this is an, a server that's been attacked, and it it made it made it virtually impossible for a user to get mm -hmm. into any website there. So where did this screen come from? Google it came from Google. Mm -hmm. Google shut me down mm -hmm. because all my certain all my websites down because it considered my server dangerous. It made that that call yep. and shut me down. Mm -hmm. What power? You know, it goes back to Yelp. Mm -hmm. yep. You don't like Yelp, you make them disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, like my server, for whatever yep. reason, I disappear. Yep. This is scary. It is scary, I agree. And the hope, of course, is that competition keeps it fair. Because the conversation that you and I might have in a year I'm making this up, of course, is, well, yeah, you know, Google search has started to come a little bit biased. And you know what? You might want to choose Bing. They seem to be a little bit better, a little bit fairer. So we have to trust, in a way, uh, competition from, from other companies to help keep Google honest, if you will. So Google has been having this uh, showdown with mm -hmm. the Chinese mm -hmm. over what they say is uh, you know, hacking into mm -hmm. their system and, um, and, oh, and, the, and the attempts of the Chinese government to mm -hmm. require them to disgorge information and mm -hmm. all that and yeah. about dissidents and whatnot. And, and, and people say, and I would say, that they were courageous, have been courageous in that. And standing up to one of the biggest, most powerful governments on earth, they stood up. There was a showdown between Google and China. And it's not clear whether Google, Google mm -hmm. lost, and Google may have won this. So <clears throat> ultimately, I think there's going to be a showdown between Google and other governments. And mm -hmm. it's going to be around Google's information mm -hmm. that you talk about, and those governments desire to get that information. Mm -hmm. And Google will say no, hopefully, and those governments will, will, will be mm -hmm. left to their own devices, and Google may win that. Let's assume for a moment Google wins. Okay. Google, then, is more powerful than the government. That's power. That is power. Information I think the power. jury is out on that. Google has uh, continued to uh, filter its search results in China. They indicate that there is an ultimatum out there, but the discussions are obviously still ongoing. So China is certainly pay att paying attention to Google. And one of the observations, I have a number of friends in China, is, is uh, the best educated, the better educated folks in China tend to choose Google much more than the domestic rival, which is Baidu. Now, Baidu has a much larger overall market share for search engine in China than Google does. But of the university educated, uh, indeed the senior government officials as well, Google is the search engine that is trusted more for having a better and broader sense of information. So do you turn off the digerati? Do you disempower the folks that you'd really like to see be the rising stars in your country? There's an enormous policy battle going on within China. So it, yeah, clearly Google has become a force in the world. There's another battle that's going on in uh, <clears throat> Italy over the past two weeks. Italy has uh, said that it is going to start to request uh, YouTube and other content carriers, if you will, <clears throat> to uh, filter the, the, uh, the uploads that people do to make sure there's no you know, pornography. I mean, who knows what it is. Um, and YouTube, which of course is another part of Google, <clears throat> has said, no, we're a common carrier. Uh, people report that there is uh, a problem with this. We'll look at it and take it down. Uh, but that's not our responsibility. We are not a content manager. Uh, we're simply a, uh, a common carrier receptacle. So here you have another uh, battle that's starting to emerge in terms of what amounts to freedom of the press, freedom of speech around you know, Facebook, YouTube, and so forth, uh, Twitter. Interestingly enough, Facebook, MySpace, YouTube, and Twitter are not available in China. Because guess what tools were used in the, uh, the pushback to Ahmadinejad in Iran uh, during the elections? Twitter and Facebook were the organizing mechanisms for Iranians to organize those uh, those protests so they become to fight a, back at the, the paintballs. <clears throat> yeah, dangerous for government to allow it. Mm -hmm. If they have the power to stop it, they outlaw and stop it, and then they have achieved their own momentum, mm -hmm. the momentum of of stopping it. They have. And they're out. Yep. So it's always a political battle, is it not? It is. For one of these companies to do business in, in, in a country which may be a little bit uh, repressive. That's freedom of speech 
on a grand scale, a, a scale never possible uh, Isn't before. That true? It's a beautiful idea. The whole world is transparent. Mm -hmm. The whole world can see the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, if even if you live in a remote place, uh, mm -hmm. a place that has never seen the light of day, once you get Google, once you get the internet, your whole world changes, whole and you come changes. forward immediately. Mm -hmm. So Google must think about this. I mean, they're a hundred and eighty-four billion dollar company last time I looked. That's big. That's bigger than Microsoft. And uh, isn't it interesting how things have changed. Yes. And they have a bunch of guys sit around, smart guys, young guys, very vital guys, just like you and me. <laughs> 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 they sit around in a room yeah. <clears throat> trying to figure out the future of Google vis the the future of the world. And they think in global terms as no private company I think has ever. So what do you think they're thinking about? Boy, it's very difficult to get inside <coughs> their heads, Jay. Uh, but I think you can see uh, something about that. And, and for Google, the world is about information, certainly for Eric Schmidt. I think that's what Eric brought to the table in terms of a model uh, versus um, the two founders, Larry and Sergey Brin, um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Uh, and you can see that in terms of the information kept on uh, on YouTube, the Google application, store your information with us, Gmail, and so on and so forth. It's, it's about not just uh, finding things, but it's about essentially encapsulating your world, being your information provider and every other, informa every other person's information provider, and extracting the synergies and the monetizable po possibilities within that. Uh, the more they know about you and what you do, the more they can target advertising to you and other products and so forth. And we're already beginning to see uh, Google starting to charge for some of their more premium products now to either remove advertising or get greater functionality. So I think the, uh, the platform has to continue to be information. Uh, it seems to me that they are going to need to continue to have objectivity in the indexing of that information, search if you will, because otherwise people will defect and people will start calling, hey, Yelp results disappeared from, from, uh, from Google, Jay. What do you think about that, <laughs> right? So, or whatever it is. So they have to have some integrity there, but at the same time, the power of what they extract within that information, the information that they keep on everybody uh, uh, in this room and everybody watching this is a, is a powerful and weighty responsibility upon them. Yeah, not to be evil. Not to be evil. Yeah. You know, but, you know, the newspaper issue is a very interesting issue um, because, uh, say, the New York Times uh, charges nothing. It's going to change, but mm -hmm. right now it, it charges is. nothing for access to its Internet online version. However, it charges uh, relatively a lot of money for its paper, yes. which is not as current, which mm -hmm. is not as immediate, mm -hmm. which is not as accessible or searchable and so yeah. forth. So you say this is backward, and indeed there was an article about that in the, in the International Herald Tribune mm -hmm. by a guy who used to work for the Wall Street Journal, <laughs> which, which does have it right. Murdoch in the Wall Street Journal, they have it right, yeah. they're charging. Yeah. So you take, you take a very simple service like news, <clears throat> and you make it worldwide to everybody who speaks English or could, and you say, we are going to charge you just a little bit, just a little bit. And we are going to be the, you know, the 800-pounder the on the block. Mm -hmm. And that little bit mm -hmm. is going to make a fortune for us. Mm -hmm. News, mm -hmm. I suggest to you, is going to be more profitable when, when the transformation mm -hmm. is complete than it ever was for more people. Why? Just the demographics. Mm -hmm. Just these huge millions, billions of people mm -hmm. who are going to need it. It only has to go through the, 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 the transformation. Right. Now, tell, hold that for a minute and look at Google. Can I say I agree with you first and then allow okay, you to keep okay. going? Okay. Now look at Google. Google yeah. is, you wouldn't say a monopoly, there are competitors, sure. but it's close. Mm -hmm. Globally, it's close. And it's probably getting, you know, mm -hmm. they're getting to be more, you know, ubiquitous all the time. Yeah. So <clears throat> suppose one day they decided, you know, we really got to make some money on this. Mm -hmm. The ads are nice, that, you know, that little click-through mm -hmm. thing, that's nice, but we're going to mm -hmm. charge. We're going we're to take your credit card. We're going to charge you something per month for the right to do searches mm -hmm. on Google. What's going to happen? I mean, to me, this is, mm -hmm. this is the looming question mm -hmm. about their, you know, their business model in the future. Um, well, that is a good question. Uh, I think there is a difference between <clears throat> search and news. 
uh, in two important respects. Um, first, uh, search is an automatable process. It's simply searchers that are crawling around the web, the internet, computers crawling around the internet and indexing it. Um, that's a, a somewhat of a fixed cost and then the connectivity to it. News is not, when you separate it from blogging and other types of things, when you talk about serious news with serious reporting. Um, news has a variable cost to it. There's a, you know, there's something called the, the CNN effect. CNN has four camera teams. There used to be four, maybe it's changed now, um, around the world. And a few years ago, there was a huge hurricane that hit Central America and killed something like seven or 8,000 people. CNN's cameras were there. They were not in Bangladesh where at the same time a typhoon hit and killed 150,000 people. Now for the United States, that event didn't exist. It didn't happen because CNN wasn't there. So reporting costs money, whether it's local reporting on a region here in uh, Honolulu, uh, over in Maui, what have you, uh, and nationwide. And thank goodness we still have the New York Times, which has international bureaus. Thank goodness we still have the BBC and some of the other true reporting bastions there. And I am looking forward to the day when I will pay the New York Times. I'll be one of the first to sign up because I am willing to pay for objective, um, true news sources. It, that, has to, that has to exist. That has to continue. Without true and fair reporting, democracy can, cannot exist. That is the basis of our democracy. And I believe that's as much true here in Honolulu. I wish Knight Ritter and the other newspaper chains would all get together and follow Mr. Murdoch in the New York Times and say, Whatever the date, you pick a date, Valentine's Day next year, uh, it's going to cost you some amount per month, and you will get access to all of the Knight Ritter newspapers. Well, is that terribly important for, for uh, people in Honolulu to get access to all of the Knight Ritter newspapers? Not really, except that you want to read the Honolulu Advertiser, or you want to read the Star Bulletin, local news, if you will. If true local news disappears, that is uh, a, a, a burden which we do not know how to bear. It will have an impact on a democracy greater um, than uh, almost anything you can imagine. So I'm looking forward to paying. I can't wait. I'll pay for the Honolulu Advertiser. I'll pay for the New York Times. Uh, and I'm looking forward to doing it. I want those in institutions to be healthy. Would you want paper copies? Um, I don't necessarily want paper copies. And that's the wonderful thing about the Internet. It does away with the variable copy of distributing paper. Don't huge infrastructure. You don't huge need Huge infrastructure. Yeah. The presses go away. Yeah. Yeah. And that means they can make more money. That means they should be able to make more money. Yeah. And they've got to start, I think they've got to start essentially deciding to essentially cut over to paid roughly together. Because if they don't, you'll see cherry picking and somebody saying, well, you know, we're going to stay free a little that's bit true, longer. We'll get true, all the people over true, here. That's true. Uh, so, and then what is the, the question of what, what about the press groups? What happens to AP? Do they say, well, Forget the Honolulu advertiser, right? That's just a layer on top of the AP reporters that are writing the stories. We'll become the news sources. I don't know how it's going to play out, but I do know that we're going to have to pay. We should pay for news. We should be willing to pay something for news. I'll pay. I'll pay, too. All right. It's a deal. Hey, Tim. Tim Dick, thank you so much for coming down, man. We've got to do this again. We do. Gee thank whiz, you, Jason. a lot of fun. This is better yeah. than Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll tell him that together. Yeah. We can charge. Can we charge? Can we, make some, can we make some money on this? Think about it. <laughs>